Two heart attacks, one stroke, one heart transplant. Day in the life for many cardiologists. Unfortunately, it's also the shared experience of the three hosts of this new series, Heart to Healthy Heart, plant-based conversations that can save your life. I'm Jim Spellos, PBMNY Network Tech Advisor and Event Specialist, and with my co-hosts, Judith Zerden and Ben Martins. Say hi, folks. We are here for the next, hopefully, months after month to be able to share with you what is out there in terms of understanding cardiovascular disease and how a plant-based diet can be beneficial and, dare I say, sometimes life-saving. We encourage everybody to use the chat box tonight to tell us where you are, as well as to ask any questions of our special guest. We of us also have a few questions which we want to ask, and we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible in our 30-minute time slot that can accommodate. But before any questions, let me introduce the special guest to you right now. We are so excited that tonight we have Dr. Robert Osfeld with us. Dr. Osfeld is Director of Preventive Cardiology at Montefiore Health System and a Professor of Medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He treats patients with adult cardiovascular disease, including coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and erectile dysfunction with a focus on prevention and treatment through lifestyle change. We've asked him today to share the big picture about this topic. Dr. Osfeld, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for that generous introduction. It's a real honor to be here <clears throat> with you all and kudos to all of you for putting together such an incredible program. Um, so it's, it's terrific to be here, thank you. And we are gonna be speaking about confessions of a reformed cardiologist, that's me, a plant-based diet in your heart <clears throat> and we'll go pretty quickly, but uh, you know, I went through many, many years of medical training and learned almost nothing about nutrition along the way. I kind of knew when I was done with my training that a Mediterranean style diet was kind of healthy. And anyway, so I came down to Montefiore to work uh, and did all the things I was trained to do, medications, which could be helpful, procedures when needed, and maybe a Mediterranean style diet. And people got a little bit better, but they didn't get a lot better. And I was kind of getting disillusioned. Like I didn't go into medicine to help people get a little bit better. And it was right around then that I learned about the impact of a plant-based diet. One thing led to another, started our cardiac wellness program at Montefiore here with the goal of preventing disease with a plant-based diet. And outside of a medical emergency, like somebody gets shot and has to be put back together again, I've never seen anything come close to the breadth and depth of benefits that a plant-based diet provides. Um, so I thought I'd start with a quick case, which helped me realize that we we're on a pretty good path um, uh, with a patient we saw kind of early on during our program. And this is a guy who was in his, he was 60. Um, he didn't have a past medical history and he started to develop chest discomfort with walking around. And sometimes he'd even get it when sitting still. And his uh, primary care doctor uh, got a stress test um, and a uh, stress test was positive, and it's only in medicine that the word positive means something bad. And he, uh, which, so, so it suggests that there were major blockages in the blood vessels that feed his heart with blood that were causing this, the discomfort, the kind of disease that can also lead potentially to heart attack and stroke. <clears throat> and, he's, and so, but he told his doc, I don't want to take any medications. I don't want to have any procedures. And the patient's the boss. That's not uh, medical advice to not take medications in that setting, but people can, you know, obviously they're the boss of themselves. So in that milieu, he came to see us and you can see his body mass index, 25 is normal. Below that is normal, about 20 to 25. And his is a little bit elevated. His blood pressure is a little bit elevated. We'd want it less than 130 over 80. His LDL <clears throat> cholesterol was quite high. And he was walking about one to three blocks on average. And he would stop because of chest discomfort. And he again reiterated, he was not interested in any medications. Um, and so what we had left was lifestyle change. And of course, medications are quite indicated in this situation. It's all of the above to help protect someone, not just one or the other. But at any rate, so we uh, he switched to a, a healthier dietary pattern. Um, and so we went on to a plant-based diet, which includes uh, 
lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, tofu, yams, nuts, and seeds is what is the plant-based diet that he pursued. Um, <clears throat> and just so that you know, heart and blood vessel disease is unfortunately exquisitely common. We'll circle back to him to see how he did on his plant-based diet. And uh, so about two heart attacks happen every minute in the US. A heart attack is when part of the heart muscle dies from a cholesterol blockage. And um, uh, so an, uh, heart and blood vessel disease is the number one killer of adult men and adult women in the US. Now, women are about six to seven times more likely to die from heart and blood vessel disease than they are from breast cancer. Now, clearly you do not want either one, but it highlights the epidemiologic importance for cardiovascular disease in women. And of course, it's a very expensive disease process. Now, unfortunately, about 65% of kids between the ages of 12 and 14 have early signs of cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed their hearts with blood. And we know this from pathology studies of kids who died for other reasons, but you don't have to worry because it gets worse. So these are famous uh, autopsy studies of Korean War, of, of, war veter of US war veterans, uh, young uh, kids who died in, or soldiers who died in war, 18, 19, 20 years old. And you can see a very high percentage of them had, or, had overt coronary artery disease. In a more modern study, uh, about 111 consecutive trauma victims, uh, age 26 on average, almost 80% of them had overt coronary artery disease. Um, and so how do we get this disease? Well, this is a normal artery. This is not surprisingly an abnormal artery. These are the endothelial cells that line the inner wall of the artery, and we want to treat them well. Uh, they can protect us. They're kind of like a wallpaper, an inner lining here. But <clears throat> these cells can get injured, whether it's through a toxic Western diet, inflammation, uh, smoking, tobacco. And when that happens, they get injured. These little cholesterol particles can burrow across into the wall where they can become very, they can become oxidized and irritating like a splinter. You know, if you get a splinter in your finger, it gets all red and inflamed. Same kind of thing, but here in the wall, the vessel where it can make the endothelial cells sicker, causing inflammation, oxidative stress, calling in more and more cells, um, and the plaque can grow and grow. And then there's a thin fibrous cap that overlies all this cholesterol plaque, and it may be the only thing separating the, the lumen of the artery where the blood flows from all the cholesterol plaque. And you don't ever want these two things to touch because if they do, this, this stuff can make the artery clot off and have no more blood flow. That's a heart attack, no more blood flow to the heart muscle. So we want to avoid that from happening or, or stem the tide. Now, this is a picture of an artery. You can see a lot of cholesterol plaque and this person had plaque rupture. All this cholesterol plaque got exposed to the blood, it clotted off and this person obviously died. This is a picture of a heart. This is a coronary artery here. This is a clot where the person had a heart attack uh, and of course they died. But there is a wonderful lifestyle opportunity to help stem the tide. And uh, the inner heart study demonstrated that 90% of the risk for heart attack can be accounted for by the following nine risk factors. And all the ones with asterisks are somewhat diet related, abnormal lipids, high blood pressure, well, smoking, of course, diabetes, abdominal obesity, psychosocial factors, consumption of fruits and vegetables, alcohol, and regular physical activity. And what this is a very interesting study uh, where they looked at life simple seven, smoking, body mass index, physical activity, healthy diet score, total cholesterol, blood pressure, and a measure of diabetes. These are developed by the American Heart Association to try to assess the health of the population. In this particular study, I want to uh, they, they gave each one of these one of three levels, poor, intermediate, or ideal. Ideal got two points, intermediate one, poor, zero. And I'll go back to that in a moment, but I want you to focus on the healthy diet score. If you, they are five components that made up the healthy diet score. If you had four or five of those, you were ideal, zero or one, poor. Those five elements in this study was consuming at least four and a half servings of fruits and vegetables a day, three servings of whole grains a day, low salt consumption, low sugar consumption, and fatty fish consumption at least two times a week. That's how they defined it for this study. If you had four or five of those, you were ideal. 0.7% of the people in this study, representative US sample, had an ideal dietary pattern, 0.7. So people argue and yell and scream about which is the super most optimal, super duper diet. That's a distraction. We are so far away from that as a society that every little bit counts. Um, and a poor diet, almost 75% of the people had zero or one of those five components. They also made a total cardiovascular health score um, where a low score, 
you can go from zero to 14 because each one is zero, one or two, and there were seven components. Um, the low score, almost 60% of the people had low and high, 12 or 14 points, only about 7%. Why does it matter? Well, if everybody developed a healthy diet score for one year, that would lower, they estimated, cardiovascular event rates by over 40%. And if everybody just achieved a normal blood pressure, that would lower cardiovascular event rates after one year by about 40%. So it matters, and it's never too early to begin, never too late to start. <clears throat> this is the data from the Cardia study, coronary artery risk development in young adults, where they followed uh, many uh, young uh, people free of heart disease for quite some time. In this study, this analysis, about 5,000 people followed for 32 years. The highest versus lowest quintile of a plant-based diet was associated with a 52% lower hazard of cardiovascular disease. And if you changed after time to the uh, a highest uh, quintile of a plant-based diet versus changing to a lower, that was associated with a 61% a, a, a lower hazard developing heart disease. So it's never too early to begin and, and never too late. Of course, the devil's in the details. You can be plant-based and eat sugar cookies or plant-based and eat kale. And does that matter? Well, clearly it does. Um, and, and the devil's in the details. This is a wonderful study by Satija where they asked if you ate a plant-based diet, was it good or not good? And the more of a plant-based diet you ate, the lower your hazard for heart disease. But there's got to be a difference between sugar cookies and kale. So they split people up into a healthy plant-based diet and an unhealthy plant-based diet. And if you ate the healthy plant-based diet, you did better still. But if you ate the unhealthy plant-based diet, you did even worse. So sugar cookies are not your friend. You know, whole, a whole minimally processed or smartly processed plant-based diet, that is your friend. Um, and even the less healthy plant-based foods here did even worse than an animal-based diet numerically in this study. Uh, this is a wonderful meta-analysis of a very, very large meta-analysis of eating whole grains and more whole grain consumption is associated with less diabetes, less heart disease, less colon cancer. In this study, they asked if you eat more fresh fruit, is it helpful, is it not helpful? In this study, it was helpful. Eating more fresh fruit um, over time was associated with less heart disease, less stroke. Um, <clears throat> this study is fascinating because this looks gets at uh, genetic risk. And I have a lot of patients say, hey, doc, my mom had diabetes, my dad had heart disease, I'm going to have it. Well, genes matter, but lifestyle matters too. In this study, they looked at multiple genetic risk factors, uh, and multiple genes. And if you had, if you were in the high genetic risk group, which is this group here, versus the low genetic risk group here, not surprisingly, your risk of having a cardiovascular event was higher. But what's particularly interesting is they split people up into lifestyle. Even in the high genetic risk group, this is an unfavorable lifestyle, an intermediate lifestyle, and a favorable lifestyle. If you developed a favorable lifestyle, even in the high genetic risk group, you lowered your future risk of a cardiovascular event by about 50%. How did you get into the favorable lifestyle group? You had to exercise at least once a week. What if you exercise four times a week? And, and you had to eat from 50% of a group of healthy foods. What if you ate from 75% of them? You think your risk would be even lower. Eating more fruits and vegetables is associated with lower mortality. And this fascinating cohort study, five versus two servings of fruits and vegetables a day is associated with a 13% lower hazard of mortality. You don't have the perfection does not need to be the enemy of good. In this analysis, it demonstrates that replacing just 3% of your calories from animal protein with 3% of calories from plant-based protein is associated with lower mortality across multiple different kinds of animal uh, protein, processed red, red meat, unprocessed poultry, fish, eggs, dairy in this analysis. And a plant-forward or largely plant-based diet is wholly consistent with the American College of Cardiology primary prevention guidelines, and where they say a diet emphasizing intake of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and fish, <clears throat> and this recommendation is, is recommended to decrease atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. If we look at uh, different nutrition breakdown of different dietary patterns, plant-based Mediterranean and low-carb dietary pattern for 500 calories, Plant-based is equal parts tomato, spinach, lima beans, and potatoes. Mediterranean is 40% of the plant-based arm, plus a half a piece of skinless chicken and one teaspoon of olive oil. Low carb is one cup of 1% milk. I'm sorry, and one cup of 1% milk in Mediterranean. The low carb pattern is equal parts beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk. You can see here, you don't need to eat any cholesterol. Your body makes all you need. 
protein, oh my God, my muscles are going to fall apart tomorrow. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take Patrick Baboumian's word for it. He is the world's strongest man and he's vegan. How do I know he's the world's strongest man? Because he won the world's strongest man contest. That's how I know. Beta carotene, it's subtle dietary fiber. Your constipation will go away. Iron, calcium, uh, the nutri nutrient profile uh, lines up pretty favorably. Let's circle back to our guy. So he went plant-based. He wouldn't take medications, no procedures. And of course, we don't recommend that. But at any rate, he lost a good bit of weight. His body mass index normalized. His blood pressure normalized. His LDL fell a lot. He could walk about a mile. It stopped because of chest pain. Fast forward about a year. Blood pressure remains low. LDL cholesterol is good. And he could jog about two miles. Stopped because of chest, chest discomfort. And I bumped into him about four or so years ago. And he now jogs four miles and stops because he gets bored. This is a great quote. Today, no one can deny the possibility of adequate nutrition and the prolonged maintenance of health and vigor on a vegetarian diet. That's from the journal, the American Medical Association in 1912, before the term vegan was even coined. Of course, there's cost benefit of being more plant-based from health-related costs, and there's planetary health benefit. Um, I think given, I think, I'm about up with time, so I will skip the erectile dysfunction portion of the talk, and I will tease Dr. Kim Williams uh, or, or him. That his This is a wonderful quote from him. This is, I recommend a plant-based diet because I know it's going to lower their blood pressure, improve their insulin sensitivity, and decrease their cholesterol. Uh, we had the opportunity to make a, a, a cardio nutrition podcast with the American College of Cardiology. You can get it anywhere where you get podcasts. Um, and it has about 15 bite-sized, 10 to 15, 10 to 20 minute episodes uh, regarding uh, different dietary patterns, nutrition uh, topics if people are interested. So thank you very much. Absolutely amazing, Doc. And what I want to do right now is bring on both Judy and Ben because they have a couple of questions to ask you. And then we're going to take a few from the audience. So Judy, you want to kick it off? Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much, Dr. Ostfeld. It's great to see you. And thank you for that wonderful presentation. So what's your view on, quote, everything in moderation as a dietary strat strategy for cardiovascular health? Oh, uh, well, well, thank you so much. I, I think that's pretty, as you know, a pretty vague thing and gives basically people license to kind of do whatever they want. We certainly don't need perfection to be the enemy of good, but I do like to get into specifics. Some people will say, well, do you want a moderately sized heart attack or a moderately sized stroke? I do like to dive into some of the specifics and put some kale on that stem, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of that kind of broad statement. Ben, you're muted. Ben, you're muted. Dr. Osfeld, other cardiovascular benefits to being 100% whole food plant-based? That's a great question. We don't unequivocally have the answer. Um, we certainly know from a variety of studies that the more plant-based people get, the, the it's associated with improved cardiovascular outcomes, um, but they're looking at quintiles or, or deciles. Uh, so, you know, if someone goes 100% versus 96%, I can't unequivocally tell you that that's clearly better. We do know that one unhealthy meal can briefly negatively impact blood vessel function, but that will recover after about six hours or so. And whether that has any significance long term, hard to say. So we certainly know that more is better, but whether 100% is better than 96%, we honestly don't know. Dr. Osfeld, what would you say are the best foods for endothelial health? Well, I think that uh, green leafy vegetables, if I had to pick one, are real rock stars uh, when it comes to improving um, endothelial health. I think uh, beets are also incredibly helpful uh, with that. Um, and uh, I think um, maybe there's there's a little bit of data that dark uh, cherries maybe, but I would go with green leafy vegetables and beets. What about cruciferous vegetables? How are they in the spectrum? Um, I, they're quite excellent. They're they have fiber, lots of nutrients, and I've never I've, I've never seen a ranking of you know where they've done a, a, a 
breaking it down by different kind of vegetable where they look specifically at endothelial function. Um, so, uh, I, you know, basically all societies recommend those kinds of vegetables in addition to beets and green leafy vegetables, but how they rank up with endothelial function specifically, I'm not sure. I don't think anyone unequivocally knows that answer, to be honest. Uh, but if so, if I had a pick, I think they're great, but I would go with green leafy vegetables and beets. Thanks. There has been a lot of talk about uh, the heart healthiness of olive oil. What are your thoughts about including olive oil in a, in a whole food plant-based diet? So I think olive oil can be helpful. The reason I get concerned about it for my patients is sometimes it can be quite calorically dense. So if people have a lot of it and there are issues with obesity, um, you know, that, that can be a concern. Um, and I know that there have been you know, ridiculous battles online <laughs> about uh, olive oil. And, and I think that's largely a distraction because there's so, you know, we're so far as a society away from even eating remotely healthily as that study really nicely outlined. But I think the totality of the evidence supports that a modest amount of olive oil actually is helpful or can be helpful. So I do not encourage my patients, and you don't have to tell Essels to this, I love his work, he's a great friend, but I do not encourage my patients to completely eliminate healthful oils such as olive oil or canola oil. I do encourage them to not have palm oil and not have coconut oil. Okay, um, what do you advise your patients about exercise for cardiovascular health? So exercise is, of course, wonderful. Uh, some people call it the fountain of youth. Um, and, you know, so I do encourage that uh, people do it. All kinds of guidelines are supportive of it. And, you know, some of our patients really all get short of breath walking the block. So anything that someone can do, and at a minimum, I encourage 20 minutes a day, anything you can do, arm, you know, moving the arms, moving the legs, go for a walk. It doesn't have to be a big production. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes in a row. Every little bit counts. So uh, definitely encourage, and if someone is able to and healthy to, I do think that high intensity interval training, if that's an option, a safe option for someone, does provide additional benefit of, uh, above and beyond just sort of going for a brisk walk. What questions should we be asking our cardiologist that aren't being asked currently? Well, I think a, a, a good proactive question to ask is, how can I best protect myself from heart and blood vessel disease? And, you know, your cardiologist will have different experience. Um, they may recommend some dietary things, some, some lifestyle modifications, maybe screening for sleep apnea. So it would help, I think it would help focus their thinking on that for perhaps longer than they might in an average appo appointment and may provide you benefit because they may think, oh, you know, gosh, that reminds me there's a certain blood test that I should check for you or something we should screen for for you. So many great questions. We have a few that are coming in from the viewers on the live stream, so hopefully you have a couple of minutes to be able to take those as well. I'd be honored. Fantastic. The first one comes and it's pretty straightforward. Do you need to take fish oil supplements if you're vegan? That's a good question. It's not um, unequivocally clear. The certainly we recommend that people have hemp seeds, chia seeds, or ground flaxseed meal, but that gives you ALA, um, and it does not. Uh, not everybody converts the ALA to omega three well. Um, now, uh, so consume. You know the the supplements that are over the counter. Some of them, you know, it's it's a it's a bit of a crapshoot because some of them may be exactly what they say they are, but they're not regulated and they're, they're, they may not have what they say. They could have lead, they could have mercury, the omega-3 could be oxidized. So it's a little harder, um, but if someone's vegan, I mean, certainly uh, uh, I do think belt and suspendering the conversion of the ALA to the omega-3 is in their interest. Uh, you can certainly get prescription uh, fish oil supplements, but if they're vegan, that may not be a fit. Um, and when they're prescription, then you know what you're getting. Um, and the, uh, but so I do think on, on totality, if someone is vegan, it is reasonable for them to take an algae oil uh, supplement as reputable a brand as they can get. 
Fantastic. So someone asked, is there a vegan substitute to fish? Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, there are companies that are trying to make uh, a, a, a vegan fish. There's one company I know of, I have no financial relationship with the company. It's called Ish. I don't think it's available yet. I don't know, but they're trying to make various uh, vegan fish options. There probably are other ones. There are vegan sushis. Uh, so uh, there, there, are there are companies that are working on uh, exactly that. I also got a question from a, a woman saying, if a female is a yo-yo dieter eating vegan uh, and goes overweight from time to time, is there still risk for heart issues? Well, yes. I mean, um, I, I guess I'm not sure. It, the devil's in the details there. Um, and, you know, I, I guess if they're a yo-yo dieter and if they, when I guess if they're off the wagon, they're eating lots of sugar cookies and things that are unhealthful, that's certainly going to increase risk. We know that if someone becomes obese, even if they're fit, the, the, the quote, you know, fat but fit, uh, it's not completely heart protective. Uh, there is, there are various subtle metabolic abnormalities that happen when someone is like that. So, which can be unhealthful for cardiometabolic health. Um, so I suspect that that is not ideal for this person's cardiovascular health. Um, but, you know, uh, people, we do the best we can. We don't want to have perfection be the enemy of good. So doing something in, the, in a positive direction, of course, is better than nothing. I think we have time for two more. Here's one that just came in, and that is, have there been any findings showing that this type of whole plant eating helps with sleep apnea? I'm not aware of specific data in regard to a plant-based diet and sleep apnea. However, you know, uh, there are randomized controlled trials of being uh, where a vegan diet versus other dietary patterns done by uh, Turner McGreevy, Dr. Turner McGreevy, it was vegan versus vegetarian versus sent like a pesco uh, uh i guess pescatarian omnivorous and there's another dietary pattern which i'm blanking on but the vegan the vegan group over six months lost seven and a half percent of their body weight and significantly more than three of the groups but not statistically significantly more than the vegetarian group um, and also there's cross-sectional data of the Seventh-day Adventists, where the only dietary pattern that had, quote, normal body mass index was the vegans. And we know that weight, having more, being obese or overweight, is significantly associated with, with uh, sleep apnea. And losing weight can reverse sleep apnea, because if you have a lot of fatty tissue around the neck, it can make the airway close. So uh, I don't know specific data, about a reversing sleep apnea, but there's certainly reason to believe that it could be helpful in the context of healthful weight loss. We have time for one more, and this actually came in from a few different people, and it's very simple. What are your personal favorite meals for improving cardiovascular health? Well, uh, I, I do, I mean, I, I love uh, a, uh, there's one meal I love, that we'll get, it's, I get like a, a big mountain of, sometimes we'll go out to a restaurant. This is what I'll, I'll, I'll always get, like a big thing of sauteed spinach, a big thing of sauteed mushrooms, a big thing of steamed broccoli, and a baked potato, a dry, a dry baked potato with side of mustard and, and, and then with a glass of wine. <laughs> and so that's super delicious uh, for me. I love uh, the make your own salad places. Um, and using, I like to use avocado as my, and fruit as my dressing for breakfast for the longest time. I was into Honeycrisp apples and uh, peanut butter. That's just the, the nut butter. That's a big uh, favorite of mine as well. 30 minutes goes in such quick time. We have so many people saying thank you so much for your time tonight. And on behalf of all of us, Dr. Ostel, we know how important this information is. Our next show in the series is on Wednesday, the 20th of July at 7 p.m. And indeed, as Dr. Ostfeld alluded to, that will be with the president of the American, past president, I should say, of the American College of Cardiology, Dr. Kim Williams. 
If you want to watch this again, the show will continue to be on our Facebook and YouTube channels. And we've also put a link in for registration for next week. So on behalf of Dr. Othfeld, Judith, and Ben, we want to thank you all for tuning in. We wish you optimal health. And we do hope that we see you again in a month right here on Heart and Healthy Heart. Thank you.